Today's keynote speaker exemplifies our motto, to believe in your potential and aspire to lead. We look forward to hearing from former, former astronaut Jose Hernandez after lunch, whose story of perseverance to achieve one's dream will undoubtedly motivate each and every one of us to shoot for the stars. Jose, thank you for joining us today. Last night over dinner, the students had the opportunity to visit with University of Texas President Bill Powers. He has graciously joined us again today to extend greetings from the university. Under President Powers' leadership, the university has earned the status as a world-class research university. But that's not enough. Elevating the university's academic standing to become the best public university in the nation is his goal. President Powers' dedication in seeking excellence in the classroom and with, and with research is what makes this campus so great. Please help me welcome the 28th president of the University of Texas, Bill Powers. Well, thank you. <clears throat> thank you all. Thank you, Leticia. Um, it is so wonderful to be here and to look over this uh, room and see these truly uh, marvelous young people who are going to be the future of our state, the future of our country, uh, the future of our place in the world. Uh, it was such a delight <clears throat> to spend some time with you last night at dinner uh, and to uh, you know, talk about your dreams and uh, your week here. And I want to again, uh, as I did last night, just congratulate all of the students uh, who have come here, uh, been on our campus, uh, and had, I think, a, uh, a transformative week. What a wonderful program uh, Subiendo is. Uh, but I just want to tell you, I, I got home last night, and uh, my wife asked how was. I said it was just a wonderful, wonderful evening for me. And it's good to be back here uh, to see you all again. I did get, uh, I think, most of your cards. Uh, <clears throat> uh, that's a great tradition of this program, and you will get a letter from me. Uh, and I hope you'll stay in touch uh, as you go forward uh, and, and pursue your dreams as leaders of your communities. Uh, and the parents who are here, uh, it, is, it is a delight. Uh, to be able to see you. I hope I get to visit with many of you uh, as the lunch goes on and after lunch. But let me just say to you, uh, you, I know, are and ought to be so proud of your sons and daughters who are here with us uh, during this week. It is an amazing group of young people. Uh, they've worked hard. They have uh, uh, thought through some complex policy issues and then made presentations to policy leaders in the state from outside the program. And even before I got to dinner last night, <clears throat> the word back from people off the campus was that this was just an amazing set of presentations. Hard work, hard thought, and wonderful uh, just presentations uh, over these difficult policy issues. And that's been our experience the entire week, uh, is this is just a, a absolutely tremendous group of young people. So to all of the parents, uh, thank you for entrusting them to us for uh, a week. Uh, I know this is a, uh, an exciting and a, a bit anxious period in their lives and your lives as you prepare to send them off to college. You've got a little bit of time uh, left. Uh, but as they're thinking where they're going off uh, to college, uh, and uh, I just want to, you know, I have five children myself. Uh, all of them I've sent off to college. I know some of you have sent older brothers and sisters off to college. For many of you, it's the first time. Uh, it's exciting. Uh, it, it's a new experience for them. But I, uh, God bless you all 
as parents uh, as you're uh, seeing this next uh, stage in your sons and daughters' uh, lives go forward. And I hope the students will take a moment uh, as they were away from their families doing marvelous things for the week, but as you sort of reunite with your families and reflect on this experience, I hope that you will realize first that you are, uh, you are leaders. As you heard last night, and Eduardo's advice to you last night I thought was just so on. You don't know where the, where the zigs and zags and the forks in the road will be. But you're, you're ready to, to make those choices and then pursue something you enjoy and are proud of with absolutely all your vigor. You're the ones that are going to make this happen. Uh, and, and as I said last night, you ought to be very proud of your accomplishments. But also, as you reunite with your families, realize you know, nobody in this life does things alone. And you're reunited with the people that changed your diapers, right? that uh, picked you up when you uh, stumbled and scuffed your knee, and were there with your joys and with your sorrows and uh, nurtured your, you through. So uh, I hope this is an opportunity to, to reflect on what your parents have done for you and pointing you in the right direction. Uh, the only other advice I'd just reiterate that both Kenny Jastro last night and, and Eduardo and many others, uh, you are leaders. It's choosing to step up to that, accepting that, and saying, yes, I am going to be a leader, and then going and doing it. Uh, and, 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 and you will do that, and you'll be the leaders of this state and your communities as we go forward. A final thought, because I know I am between you and lunch. Uh, Jose, you have the, they'll be full when you talk. And, uh, but I just would like to say one other thing, and that is you've, you've also spent a week on our campus. And I hope you've enjoyed that. And for the parents who are here, you spent some time on a, a part of our campus. You know, Subiendo is a success if you all go off and be leaders wherever you choose to pursue your dreams. Uh, whether it's at Texas Tech or UT Pan American uh, or UT. Uh, it is a success for us. Having said that, we want to see <clears throat> all of you, as many of you as we can, on the 40 acres on our campus next year. This is a fabulous place to go to university. It's a world-class teaching and research university that takes the undergraduate experience as our central mission. A big place that we break down into small family groups. And I do hope you'll get uh, a chance, or have had a chance while you're here, to see a taste of what education and life and uh, the experience is at the University of Texas at Austin. And I want to, uh, at orientation and that first few days and weeks of class, uh, pass young students uh, on the campus, see them in my office, see them at orientations and say, I know you. You started this journey uh, at Subienda. So I look forward to your success and for as many as we can, your success on our campus. So I hope you'll enjoy your lunch. Uh, Jose, I very much look forward to your remarks after lunch. And if I'm permitted, one small partisan gesture, hook them. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Y'all please keep enjoying your lunch. My name is Wolfgang Niedert. I serve on the advisory council of Subiendo and I wanted to introduce uh, the student they'll be introducing, astronaut Hernandez. Um, but while I have the floor for just a moment, on behalf of the entire advisory council, uh, Ronnie Stidman and a number of folks who are around the country and around the world right now, um, that they all join me congratulating all of you on a very tremendous week. Uh, as parents, you should be incredibly proud and the entire advisory council uh, salutes to an, uh, a fantastic experience this week and we we'll all say thank you. Um, in addition to that, let's all say thank you again to the staff, Leticia, Vanessa, all the team leaders, um, everyone that made Subiendo possible. We have the easy part of designing this program, but they execute on it and, and they'll do a tremendous job. So let's have a round of applause for all of them. Um, and I wanted to say a brief remark about yesterday's presentations and then something uh, I think appropriate to uh, astronaut Hernandez's talk. I've um, been watching y'all yesterday in those chairs at the Capitol um, giving those presentations. I was thinking about many of you will actually be sitting in those chairs one day as state legislators, as heads of uh, state agencies, as regulators. Um, you will actually literally be back in those seats one day as uh, decision makers and policy makers for this state. And when you were talking yesterday, all of you mentioned um, the passion that you had for helping people, helping the state, um, helping the environment, whatever it was, bringing health care to more people. Um, I want you to remember that passion, that selflessness that you had yesterday. Remember that when you're actually sitting again in those se seats making those decisions um, because we need more people like that and we need you to be those types of leaders and we have every confidence that you will be. And so going forward, I was thinking about uh, astrophysicist, I think Astro, uh, Hernandez might know him, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who did his master's degree work actually here at UT in astrophysics. Uh, I was watching a video of his when he talked about the very first photograph of the planet that they took off of, uh, what year was that? 69, okay, I wasn't maybe around yet, but, uh, but it was a very magnanimous uh, moment in, uh, in humankind because we, we looked back on this planet, the only pictures of the planet that we had were you know, globes in the classroom that had all the countries painted on them. And this was the first time we saw our planet with no borders, no people, no names written on anything. And it was really the first time that we realized that we're completely out here all by ourselves, but all of us working together make this planet go forward. And so um, I look at that and I realize that Subiendo is, is a wonderful basis for all of you, but we have no idea what's going to happen in 10 years. The things you're going to major in weren't even invented when I was in college. And so as I think of SpaceX, the private space travel company possibly putting a facility in South Texas, the new medical school that President Powers and others helped uh, bring to Austin here in a few years, um, all those future fields, it's very exciting, but this is just a jumping off point for all of you. This is the launch, launch pad, so to speak. The things that you're going to go on to do um, excite us, and this is just a wonderful groundwork for you all. So stay in touch with one another, that's really important. Keep in touch with us, but it's the network that you build with, with one another that's really going to make this a, a tr truly excellent experience. So um, with that, I think of another thing that Neil deGrasse Tyson said about, uh, about the mission to Mars. And uh, as you know, we've since decommissioned the uh, space shuttle fleet, but he, he encourages us to push on for the simple reason that Mars is what's next. And think of Subiendo as the space program, and think of Mars as that next step that you're going to take. We don't know what it is yet, but it's the next exciting adventure for you all. So, you know, we came out of the cave to see what was in the valley. We, we crossed the valley to go across the mountain range. Uh, with the Wright brothers, we took to space. With, through NASA and astronaut Hernandez, we took to the heavens. And we don't know what's next. Maybe it's Mars, maybe it's something else. You don't know what's next, but we have every confidence that it's going to be a fantastic experience for you, that you're going to be excellent leaders for the state of Texas and indeed the entire planet. And again, we could not be more proud of you. So congratulations again. And I want to bring up our student, James Yardo, to introduce astronaut Hernandez. James? Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Cole Yarto, and today I'm going to be introducing uh, Jose Hernandez. Jose Hernandez was born in French Camp, California in 1962. For much of his childhood, Jose worked side by side with his parents and siblings picking crops across the San uh, Joaquin Valley. At the age of nine, Jose watched in amazement as Apollo 17 brought men to the moon. From that day, Jose was determined to do whatever it took to become an astronaut. In high school, he, he participated in Upward Bound, a program designed to give disadvantaged youth help with math and science. He graduated from the University of the Pacific with a bachelor's degree in electrical engin engineering and eventually a master's degree in engineering from the University of California, Santa Barbara. Jose went on to become an engineer at the prestigious La Lawrence Livermore National L Laboratory. In his time at Livermore, Jose was recognized for his work helping to develop a way to turn 
Cold War technology into the first full field uh, digital mammography Im imaging system, which has become an invaluable tool in increasing the early detection of breast cancer. Jose was also nationally recognized for his work on behalf of both the laboratory and the U.S. Department of Energy on Russian nuclear non-proliferation -prolifer issues, an issue, uh, an issue that continues to be important to him today. Becoming an astronaut was not automatic. Jose applied to, to NASA 12 times, and after failing to make the cut, he strove to improve himself, received his pilot's license, became a master scuba diver, and learned to speak conversational Russian. The hard work paid off. In 2004, Jose reached a lifelong goal of becoming a NASA astronaut, and in August of 2009, he flew on a 14-day mission as a flight engineer on Space Shuttle Discovery's mission to the International Space Station. So let us now welcome Jose Hernandez to the podium. Thank you, James, for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, and and um, for a minute there, I wasn't recognizing who you were talking about, but I guess it was me. I, I am uh, so honored to be here as uh, part of the uh, closing ceremony of the Subiendo program. I understand you guys had, a, uh, since Sunday, a full agenda and, and had a lot of activities that I hope are gonna, you're going to be able to take with you. and and use as you go along your uh, journey, hopefully to higher education and then on to a successful professional career. I want to thank Leticia Acosta for, uh, for, for um, inviting me here and being very insistent that I come over here. She says, you have to come over. This is a great program. And, uh, and she convinced me, yeah, and I have a pretty busy schedule these days, and, and I'll explain a little later towards that, but, but she finally convinced me. I said, you know, I'm going to go ahead and do it, even if I have to get here at 2 in the morning the night before and uh, be able uh, to come here and be with you, uh, I'll be happy to do it. So, so here we are uh, going ahead and doing it. I also want to thank Wolfgang uh, Meter for, uh, for, for his support. Of, of, of this uh, Subiendo program and, and the leadership that the rest of the board provides to this program. I think it's very important that we have the community engaged uh, in this program uh, as stakeholders, and I think you're doing a great job there. And um, also, I want to thank uh, UT President, Mr. Bill Powers, for, uh, for participating in this program. You know, Mr. Powers runs this whole UT University here in Austin, and uh, he's a very busy individual. And to me, and I can appreciate this because I sit on the board of regents of my alma mater, University of the Pacific, and, and, and so I can appreciate how busy a university president is. And believe me, to have a university president sit down here and not just come here and say, hey, thank you for participating, um, you know, and, and give his little spill and then take off, uh, but to actually sit down and have lunch with us and actually listen to uh, and visit with everybody, I think speaks true to the dedication and the fact that he, he is uh, firmly committed to this program. So thank you, Mr. Powers, for your support. So. Now, what I'd like to do in this uh, next half hour, they tell me I have a half hour. I may go a little bit over, but, uh, but, but uh, so, so I'm, I'm hoping you guys let me go a little bit over. Uh, you know, this is, I'm going to break this talk more like uh, when I was a kid in church, okay? Uh, I remember when I was a kid in church, my, uh, my, my dad... My dad would always say, my mom would always bribe us, you know, when we say, when we would go to mass, they say, si se portan bien, if you guys behave, in other words, don't pinch your sister, don't elbow your brother, anything like that during mass, uh, we'll take you out and, uh, and give you ice cream afterwards, right? That was the big treat. That was the second half of the day as we went out for ice cream. Well, you know, there's too many of you for me to spring for ice cream, so I'm not going to buy ice cream to you, for you guys. But the uh, second part that I think it's a nice treat is I'm going to show you a video that summarizes my space mission to, in 2009. And with this video, you're going to get a pretty good idea what a typical space mission is like. And, and so that'll be, that'll be the treat. But first, 
I have to get on my soapbox, and you guys got to listen to my message. So, so please bear with me. But I, I you know, I, I tell it in a very anecdotal fashion, so it's very folksy. So I, I think you guys will enjoy it. As was mentioned by James, you know, I grew up. I'm a first generation Mexican American, and uh, my parents come from the state of Michoacan, Mexico. If you uh, hold Mexico on center of mass, uh, that's where Michoacan's at, right? Dead center in Mexico. And uh, we were a typical migrant farm working family. And a lot of people always say, well, what's a typical migrant farm working family like? Let me paint the picture for you, because uh, Texas uh, you know, it was similar here in Texas as it was in California. But basically, what my dad would do every February, he would load up the kids in the car with my mom, and we would make a two-day trip to, uh, to California in the uh, southern portion of the San Joaquin Valley. And we would start with the crop harvest there. We would, we would, we would start picking strawberries. We would then uh, move on hoeing sugar beets, uh, and then uh, cucumbers, cherries, green tomatoes for market, peaches. And then we would end the season around October, November time frame in the grape season. That was the last, and that was in the northern part of the San Joaquin County. So we moved about three or four different places throughout, throughout the year, from, from uh, February to November. When November would roll around, then my dad would say, would tell us, hey, tell your teachers we're going back to Mexico, so make sure you get three months worth of homework, because in Mexico we would self-study. And uh, we would do so, and come November we would take what would now be a two and a half day trip back to Michoacan. We would do our homework there every day, and then, and then come February, the process will repeat itself. So you can see how disruptive that was for the educational process of a kid, especially my age, which is in first, second grade. And you can appreciate why it took me until I was 12 years old to consider myself fluent in the English language. And uh, that was part of the reason. Uh, the, the, thing, the thing is, though, the thing is, though, that uh, as, as, as we grew older, uh, you know, things actually changed for the better. Uh, I remember I'm, I'm the, uh, the youngest of four kids, and I remember uh, in our last stop, which was Stockton, California, uh, in one particular year, I was in the second grade. And, uh, and that particular year, uh, come early November, my dad did as he usually did. He told, he told, uh, he told us kids, he said, hey, get your uh, three months worth of homework. And of course, uh, that day I, I went running to school, you know, because I had this big news to the teacher, right? Big cheese man, right? And, uh, and, and in those days, you know, we lived a mile and a half from school. You know, we crossed railroad tracks, packing sheds, and all that kind of stuff. Those days, you can walk to school f for a mile and a half. Nowadays, I think we'll get arrested for child endangerment if we uh, have our kids walk a mile and a half to school, right? But those days it was okay. So, so I went running to school that day, con el chisme, with the teacher. And, 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 uh, and, and so, uh, so I told the teacher, I remember Mrs. Young. Uh, Mrs. Young uh, was a, uh, about five years out of college, young Chinese American. She was also first generation, which is I think what, why it made such a big difference. Young Chinese American, uh, second grade teacher, beautiful, tall too. Well, I mean, tall relative to a second grader, right? But because uh, now I see her and she's kind of short, but she was tall back then, and uh, and very beautiful. Because you know, second grade, I think that was my first crush. There was my second grade teacher, but uh, but anyway, so so I go and tell Mrs. Young. I tell Mrs. Young uh, that day. I said, Mrs. Young, uh, we're we're going to Mexico uh, next week. Can you prepare three months worth of homework? And she looks at me and she kind of rolls her eyes and she says, you know. You tell your parents that I'm going to be coming home today and visit them. And I said, oh, OK. So school was out. I go back running back home now, right, the other way, because I have another big cheese, man, right? Uh, so I'm big news to, the, to, 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 the, to my parents, OK? So I get home. My parents were back from, were back from work. And, um, and, and what would happen was uh, you know, I told them separately. I told my dad first, you got to appreciate, my dad was you know, kind of serio, serious, and strict kind of thing. So I tell him the teacher was coming home. Oh, well, you know, you can imagine, the first thing he starts doing is he starts taking off his belt. 
because he figures, hey, teacher's coming, the boy must have did something bad, I might as well lash out the punishment now, right? <laughs> and, you know, I'm backtracking and, uh, and, 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 and sort of, uh, you know, uh, trying to convince him that it has to do with us going to Mexico. And, you know, he says, must have vale. So you better be sure, boy, because it's going to be twice as bad if it's not. And, and so, uh, so I, got, I got that one over with. Then I went to my mom and told her the teacher was coming. And typical Latina, Mexicana, right? You know, she gets that Macaulay Culkin uh, look, a Home Alone look, saying, teacher's coming. We got to clean the house. We got to sweep. We got to, you know, hide the dishes that are broken and bring in the new dishes and all that kind of stuff. You know, all the bells and whistles because, you know, us as Latinos, we have this great respect for educators. And so my mom wanted to impress the teacher and bring out the best. And, of course, she made fresh flour tortillas, comida, and all that kind of stuff, right? And so the teacher comes, Mrs. Young comes, and I, here I am sitting next to her. Remember, I have a crush on her, right? So I'm sitting next to her. My well, dad's sitting across, dad's sitting across, the whole family's there, and we got this marvelous food. You know, we even had meat on the table, right? You know, usually it's just frijoles and arroz, right? But, uh, but we had carnita there. Then. So I remember I'm eating and everything, and you know, life is good, right? The, the lady I like next to me, we have meat on the table. You know. I look around and there's, there's a quiet moment and I said, Mrs. Young. And she says, yes, Jose. I said, you know, you ought to come over more often. You know, I figure, <laughs> figure I'll eat better the more she comes, right? You know, and everybody laughed except my dad. You know, my dad kind of, dad, and the good thing is my dad's sitting across, right? So he kind of gave me that look. You guys, you guys have gotten that look, right? When, um, when you misbehave in front of company and he can't hit you over the head, kind of he gives you the look. I said, we're going to have a talk after she leaves. <laughs> At that point, my strategy is to prolong the, the meeting, the visit, para que, para que se le olvide, so he forgets about it, right? So, so anyway, what happened was um, we have that dinner, and then we move on into the sofa in the living room, and uh, my teacher gets down to business. And, and she basically, and, and I remember this so well because I was the translator of my parents didn't speak any, uh, any English. And Mrs. Young basically told my parents, because we were moving from place, district, school district, school district, year after year. She basically said, you know, I had, she said, I had your four kids in my class, she says. They're good kids. They seem to like school very well. She said, you need to look at your kids as trees. And she used the agricultural angle because that's what we were. We were farm workers. She said, you ought to view your kids as trees, it says. He says, what happens when you keep transplanting a tree continuously? He says, the roots never take hold. The tree is going to grow short, stunt growth, and weak. He says, you need to stay in one place to make sure that those roots grow deep, branches grow big and strong, and you have big, strong trees. He says, that's what you need to do. And, uh, and my dad and mom, who only have a third grade elementary education, took that to heart. I got to give them credit. They took that to heart because after that year, we still went to Mexico that year, but after that year, funny thing happened. Instead of going through the three or, three or four different areas in San Joaquin Valley, we came back straight to Stockton. We started making Stockton our home. Our three months trips to Mexico started to shrink to three weeks centered around Christmas, so we missed very little school. And that's when our education started to get traction. And so a lot of people always say, okay, well, you know, but, but you know, I'm, I come from a family that's very poor. I come from a family that doesn't have the resource. I come from a family where my parents don't even speak English. And that's not an excuse to, for you not to excel and push yourself. And I'll tell you why, because my parents, in spite of the fact that we were migrant farm workers, and we, we had low income, and they spoke very little English. They always emphasized education. I mean, they walked the talk in, 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 in a sense. You know, every Saturday, you know, Monday through Friday, we were in school. But every Saturday and Sunday, we were working hand in hand with my parents in the fields, picking cucumbers, tomatoes, whatever was in season. And while kids loved summer vacation, the Hernandez kids dreaded it because that's, that represented, the, that meant we had to work seven days a week in the fields, and, and we hated that, and we didn't want to do that. But my dad and mom always provided these anecdotes for us to push us and to make us think as to what 
what we were going to be doing. Because my mom always talked in the sense of, she would never say, I, I hope, oh, ojalá mi hijo becomes, grows up to be an engineer or a doctor. Ojalá esto. She never said that. She didn't say, I, I hope, I hope. She never said that. She says, when you go to college, when you become a doctor, when you become an engineer. She ingrained that in us desde pequeños, and it became an expectation on our part. My mom, every day after school, when we came home, in la cocina, in the kitchen table, we would be sitting while she made fresh tortillas and arroz and frijolitos for us to eat. We would be doing our homework, and we weren't allowed to get up until we finished our homework. Then we can go out and play with friends or watch TV. I still remember los cinturazos that I got when I lied one time, that I did my homework and I actually didn't. No me quedaron ganas after that, you know. I, I wanted to make sure that I, I told the truth after that because I remember the, uh, the, the, the belt whipping I got for that. Uh, and, 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 you know, my mom would also, we would go to a bank, for example. We would go to a bank and we would walk into a nice air-conditioned bank in the middle of summer, nice and cool. And, uh, and my mom would see a gentleman like Mr. Powers here, very finely dressed with a suit and tie. And she would grab my sleeve, you know, I'm, I'm in my torn Levi's, torn tennis shoes. And she says, what, what do you see there? And I said, well, I said, well, I see a man. She said, no. She says, yo te veo a ti. I see you. She says, this is how I want to see you when you grow up. I want to see you working in an office, wearing a suit and tie, and working with your brain. She says, your body can only take so much, and your body's going to break down sooner than your mind is, she says. So you don't want to work in physical labor. Work with your mind. Be smart about it and dress like that. And those were the type of messages that she, uh, she, she uh, gave me. My dad was a, uh, w w w did it in a different way. He did it more of a kind of like tough love kind of way. I remember one day, um, you know, we came, we came home. We were coming home from working in the fields picking cucumbers. I don't know if you guys know how you pick cucumbers, but you, def you always wear Levi's because you want to protect yourself from your knees and stuff like that. And in the morning when you go out there, the fields are freshly irrigated and you get mud all over yourself. Then the sun comes up and the, the mud bakes into your Levi's, so now you got stiff Levi's on, right? I remember we used to go home and we used to carefully take off the kids, would carefully take off their Levi's, see who could stand them up the most. And you know, <laughs> that, that was the badge of honor for us, you know. It says, el, el, el que, el, whoever could have it the stiffest era el más fregón, right? Was the, was, the, was the guy that, to us, worked the hardest. They didn't know I was the youngest one, so I rode around in the mud and I always had, I always won that, that competition, but never, never uh, won uh, the quantity of buckets of cucumbers we picked because I was too small. But, uh, but I remember one day we got out of work, we were, we were like that, we got in the back of the car, we're tired, sweaty, uh, and, and, and muddy in the face everywhere. And my dad was adjusting the, uh, he got in the, in the car and he was adjusting the rear rear mirror. And he must have saw us and, and saw all, all four of us there looking tired. And he turned around and he said, he said, ¿Cómo se sienten? He looked at each one of us, you know, right in the eye. He said, how do you guys feel? And of course, I'm the youngest one and the one that probably talks back the most to them. And I said, cansados, you know, tired. How do you, how do you expect us to feel? And he said, that's good. He says, I'm glad you feel this. Says, Remember this feeling, he says. He says, because you guys have the distinct privilege of living your future now. And I, I was, you know, I was like eight, nine years old at the time. I said, living my future now. I said, the old man got too much sun out there in the field. That's what I figured. <laughs> I said, ¿cómo que viviendo el futuro ahora? He said, you know, explain to me that. He says, yeah, he says, you know, I'm not going to force you guys to go to school. I'm not going to force you to get good grades. But if you don't, this is your future. This is, what you, this is what you will be destined to do. This is what your mom and I were destined to do. And this is your future. He says, what's more, you could stop going to school now and work with us seven days a week. So I won't object to that. And I said, whoa, hold on. Let's, let's not get too hasty here. I think I'm beginning to like school. And so, uh, and, so, uh, and so those were the tough love messages that my parents uh, gave us. And, 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 I, and like I said, you know, it doesn't, resources, money is not, it's not everything in terms of getting a good education or having your parents 
uh, provide for you in a good education, uh, for a good education. It's more the moral support. It's more of walking uh, the talk in terms of encouraging them. It's more being there with them when they're, it's time to do their homework and ensuring it. And it's not about watching the novelas or going out with the friends and drinking beer. It's more being with the kids and being engaged and involved. And that's what, that's what happened to us. So that's how our education started to get traction. Now, a lot of people always say, okay, well, that's fine and dandy, but how did a migrant farm working kid become an astronaut? How was that? How did you, guys, how did you do that? I said, well, it wasn't hard in the sense of, uh, of dreaming for it. I mean, it was hard getting here, but it wasn't hard for the sense of dreaming for it. I remember, you know, I, I was seven years old when the uh, first uh, Apollo mission, Apollo 11, went up and landed on the moon. I don't remember that one too much. For some reason or another, we were probably, that was probably one of the three months we were in Mexico. Uh, but I do remember the very last mission. Very, very clear, Apollo 17. And it was 1972, I was nine years old. And I remember, I remember when we were watching and Walter Cronkite was narrating uh, Gene Cernan's uh, moonwalk. And the way the Apollo missions work, they preempted programming, even the novelas, and, uh, and, we watched, and we watched live as the astronauts walked on the surface of the moon. And we had one of these old black and white TVs. You guys remember those black and white TVs that had the integrated speakers, big honky knob to change the channel? And uh, ours was black and white, even every once in a while you lose the horizontal sink and you get that, that annoying black bar and the scrolling of the, of the picture that the fix was that you, know, you would hit it on the side and, and that would be the fix. Uh, well, yeah, let me digress a little bit and I'll tell you a little story about, about, about that in the sense that I remember one day we were watching TV, we were watching that same black and white TV and, um, and, and, and of course my dad, I would sit down and watch TV with him and, and his way of you know, getting to change the channel is he would elbow me and say, cambia el canal, you know, change the channel. So I would get up from the sofa and change the channel. Then he would do it again. I would get up. One day, one day I don't know, maybe I was in a bad mood or something. I don't know. Yeah, but he had done this nine times. I counted it nine times, you know. And uh, I was getting a little frustrated. Yeah, and you got, you got to understand my frustration. In those days, you only got three channels, right? It was ABC, NBC, CBS. Okay, you got, you got PBS, but who watched that, right? It was just the three channels, right? And, and so, um, so, 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 I, so I told myself, I said, okay, if he tells me a tenth time, change the channel. I'm going to tell him something. And you got to understand, my dad, you know, you don't just tell him something because he's very strict. He has ways of twisting things and, and also ways of, you know, smacking you, right? And so you don't, want, you don't want to tell him anything. But I said, well, I'm going to do it. And so sure enough, the 10th time he tells me, change the channel. So, okay, I get up and I said, okay, I'm going to make sure of two things before I tell him something. First, I'm going to change the channel. That way he can't accuse me of being a disobedient kid, all right? Get, get, get that off the table. Two, I said, I'll be darned if I sit next to him with an arm's length. I'm, I'm, going, to sit, I'm going to sit at the other end of the sofa beyond his, the radius of, hit, of, of what I call the radius of getting hit, right? And, 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 that, and so I went and changed the channel and sat over there. And of course, I can watch the TV and watch him from the corner, right? So if, once I say something, if he... Uh, if he gets up, I'm, I'm long gone too, right? I start running, but, um, but, but, but uh, so I sit down and I tell myself, okay, time to man up. No que muy gallito, right? So yeah, let's go ahead and say something to your, to your dad. And so I'm, I'm trying to figure out how as diplomatic to put it. And of course, and I'm a, the budding engineer that I was, you know, I bring a problem, but I also want to bring a solution to it, right? That's, that's what engineers do, you bring solutions to a problem. So, so, I, so, I, so I tell my dad, I'm sitting down and watching the program. I said, Papi. And of course, he says in the stern voice, yes, si, mijo. And at that point, then I start blurting out like a Encyclopedia Britannica, right? I said, did you know that in Kmart, they have TVs that are color and with a remote control? You know, because they had remote control TV. You know, they were coming out now, right? You know, and I don't know why I said that. I don't know. Maybe I was thinking that my dad was going to say, well, yes, son, let's go buy one. You know, <laughs> that was not going to happen. That was not going to happen. And you guys ever say something when you blurt it out, 
you kind of regret it and you want to get those words back in your mouth. That's how I felt. That's how I felt. And and so and so what I so so what I said so what I said is uh, you know I. You know, as soon as I said that, he said, ya la regué. I said, man, I'm going to get myself in trouble. And I don't know how it is in your family, but in my family, there's five magical seconds. You know, if, if he doesn't get up in five seconds, then you're okay. But if he gets up within those five seconds, you're going to get yourself, uh, you're going to get yourself uh, a whipping, right? Well, he didn't get up, so I was in the clear. The next test was I got to make eye contact with him. And I better, and I better have the fear of God. Okay, and so I made eye contact with them, and I think the little bead, bead of sweat helped that also, because then he started, he had this frown on his face, then it turned to like pity, and kind of like, in his mind he was saying, I can't believe this is my kid, but, uh, <laughs> but he said, he said, mijo, 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 he says, why would I want to buy a TV with remote control if I have you? Yeah. <laughs> it was obvious I was the remote control, and uh, and that, that bloody TV worked for another two years, so, <laughs> so, so I had a job for, the, for two more years. But, 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 but uh, you know, that TV, we, had, we didn't have an outside antenna. We certainly didn't have cable. We had rabbit ear antennas. And, and what happened was, you know, aside from being the official channel changer, I was the official antenna adjuster. And uh, when something important came on, they would, my dad was tell, ajusta la antenna, adjust it. And I know this now because I'm an electrical engineer. But you know, once you code the antenna, you become an extension of the antenna, and the picture magically improves, right? And you no know more snowy picture. And guess what my dad would say? I quédate. Stay right there. And there I am, you know, trying to watch what they're watching while the whole family is. And, then, and, the, and the funny part is, funny part is that I would tell my, my siblings to relieve me, right? I would get tired and say, hey, you know, que un cambio, let's change. And they would just make funny faces at me and say, hey, dad said you, so you stay there. <laughs> and now we sit down in the, in the uh, dinner table, and I tell, them, I tell my siblings, I say, you know, you guys should have helped me adjust the antenna. And they laugh about it and say, well, why? I say, well, if you guys would have helped me, especially during the moonwalks, I said, um, you know, you, maybe you guys could have been astronauts too, because it was through osmosis that I became an astronaut. See, the, the, the signals went through my body, and I got programmed to be an astronaut. But, but, but that particular day, I remember when we were watching Gene Cernan walking on the surface of the moon, and once my dad was uh, kind enough to let me let go of the antenna, and I would watch in front of the TV, uh, I would watch in amazement at how Gene Cernan was bouncing around in the moon, talking to Mission Control Houston, and then I would go outside. It was nighttime, it was a full moon, and I would see the moon out there. Come back inside, see the surface of the moon on TV, and Gene Cernan there, and I just couldn't believe it. I said, wow, we have humans a quarter million miles away on the surface of the moon. I said, how cool is that? At that point, that's when I knew, all nine years of me knew that I wanted to be an astronaut. I said, this is what I want to do. I want to be an astronaut. And so, uh, so the great thing that I did when I, when, when I, uh, when I, um, uh, decided that was that I shared that with my parents. And my dad, when I shared that with my parents, I, my dad sat me down at that same kitchen table where my mom made us do our homework. And he said, a ver, a ver, a ver, que quieres ser astronauta? You want to be an astronaut? And I said, yes. He must have saw the determination in my eyes because he said, I believe you can do it. He says, you just have to follow a simple recipe. And I'll share this recipe with you guys because I think it's so important. He said, five simple ingredients, he said. First, he says, decide what you want to be in life. What is it that Jose wants to be in life? I said, okay, I want to be an astronaut. That's easy. I'm halfway there, I figured. Second, he says, recognize where you're at right now, how far you are from that goal. I said, well, I'm a migrant farm worker kid, right? Pretty far. He said, I'm glad you recognize that, son. <laughs> said, because the third step is very important. You draw yourself a road map from where you understand where you're at to where you understand where you want to go. And, and, and outline every step to get there. It says, and don't jump steps because you can still get there, but you won't be as well prepared. So don't take shortcuts was the moral of that story. Draw yourself a road map and don't take shortcuts. Fourth, he said, you're doing it right now. Get yourself a good education. Educate yourself. Get yourself a good education. I can't emphasize that. Fifth and final, he said, 
is that same work ethic you put out in the field picking cucumbers, so you put it in your books. And when you graduate college, you put it in your job. You work hard all the time, not just sometimes, all the time. It says you mix all that, Jose, and you could be whatever you want because you're here in the United States, land of opportunity, and you can reach the American dream. And I took that hook, line, and sinker. I believed it, and I, and I lived by it, and I, and, and I think the only thing I would add to it would be perseverance uh, because, uh, because as James indicated, uh, it did not, I didn't get selected the first time, the second time, or the third time. I got selected the 12th time. NASA told me no 11 times. Imagine what would have happened if I would have given up the first, second, or third time. I would never be here telling you the story. I would have never went up to the heavens would have never went up to the International Space Station. You can't give up. You just have to make sure you apply smart perseverance. And what's smart perseverance? Smart perseverance is the fact that when I applied, you know, I wouldn't feel sorry for myself for failing, and I wouldn't do anything before it was the next time to apply. I would say a class of astronauts would get selected, and I would study and say, what do they have that I don't have? One year I found out that all of them were pilots. I wasn't a pilot, guess what? I learned how to fly. Another year, when another class got started, I found out that they were all scuba divers. Guess what, I wasn't a scuba diver. I got scuba rated in Monterey, California. Basic scuba, advanced scuba, scuba rescue, first aid scuba, all kinds of scuba certification. I was a fish, I was a fish in the water. I wanted to make sure that they knew I know how to scuba dive. Then one year, one year a, a, a job came up in the nuclear nonproliferation arena that took me to Russia. I had read a month before that Russia and the United States signed an agreement to build the International Space Station. It didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out we were going to be working up in space with the Russians. And this job took me to Russia. I didn't, I didn't accept the job because I wanted to get to know the Russian Siberian countryside. I took the job because it justified my employer, Department of Energy and Lawrence Livermore Lab, to give me a personal Russian instructor so that I can learn Russian. So I learned conversational Russian enough to, I, I, I always say enough to get drunk in Russia. So, so, uh, so, so I, do know, I, 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 do, I do know how to ask for beer and things of that nature. Survival, survival phrases is what I call it. Uh, and, and so it's, 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 it's improving myself each time to make myself more attractive. And that's when I got selected to be, that's when I got selected to be an astronaut. After 12 tries and making all these changes in my life, in 2004, I got selected part of the 19th class of astronauts. And in uh, 2006, we finished astronaut training. 2008, I got assigned to a mission to the STS-128 Space Shuttle Discovery, going to the International Space Station, this is of all things. Uh, myself and six other crewmates, seven of us. One of them was a fellow colleague, lady engineer, Nicole Stott. She was, uh, she was also a, uh, a, a, a part of my crew. Another one was, uh, was Christopher Fuglesang, a Swedish astronaut. So we, it was an international mission. And we flew up, seven of us flew up to the International Space Station. And, uh, and up there waiting for us were six astronauts. Uh, and, and the commander was uh, Gennady Padalka, a Russian, so my Russian did come in handy, and, and we were up there. One thing, uh, the, just to do a full loop on, on the story with Mrs. Young, uh, we were allowed to invite about 100 guests to the launch. I made sure that the school district looked her up. She had just retired, and she was standing uh, next to my parents uh, when we blasted off into space. So I think that was uh, a pretty neat story to, uh, to sort of come full circle. If you permit me, what I'd like to do is I'd like to show you the videos just so that you, uh, you can uh, get an idea of what a uh, mission to space is like. And if you can start the video, uh, one of the first things that we do when we uh, get assigned to a mission is we design the uh, mission patch. That's like the first week of our assignment is let's let the crew design the mission patch. And the only requirement is that the last, the last minute, the, uh, the last names of each crew member is, is on that patch. And you're going to see the patch up there right now. And every mission gets their own individual patch. And that's our patch right there. Uh, we launched uh, August 28, 2009, close to midnight. It was a night launch. And you're going to see, uh, you're going to see the, uh, 
Launch director, give us the green light to launch. Yes, Gary, go ahead, sir. Well, CJ, the vehicle's clean and the teams are go. This time, Mother Nature is cooperating, so it looks like... The first thing that lights up is the three rock, the three engines. After that, the two rocket boosters, solid rocket boosters. When those light on, that's when you know you're going somewhere. Let's go step up the science on the International Space Station. I was the flight engineer, so one of the four in the flight deck. And then we had three in the mid-deck, which is the inset picture. Uh, they don't have any flight responsibilities, but don't feel sorry for them because they they are the spacewalkers. There's the launch. Solid rocket boosters are on for two and a half minutes only. And then they'll separate, and you'll see that separation. And the center tank, the center tank keeps feeding the three engines for another six minutes. And there's a separation of the solid rocket boosters. You see those three little lights uh, in the center of the picture? Those are the three engines. Exhaust of the three engines. So for a total flight of eight and a half minutes, you, you go from zero miles an hour to 17,500 miles an hour. That's a bit of an acceleration that you feel across your chest, well, known as G-forces. Right, hey, that's working hard to tank, and I'm waiting for the 20 second plus X. At eight and a half minutes, the three engines shut off. At that point, we don't have a need for that center tank, so we, uh, we separate the external tank from the uh, belly of the shuttle. Your belly is the top portion of that inside picture. And then eight and a half minutes later, we're almost 300 miles up, going around the world at 17,500 miles an hour. And there you see me giving the thumbs up because I'm a bona fide astronaut at that point. And uh, I'm the flight engineer, so you see me, I have view of uh, all the instruments. I also need proof, being a scientist, I throw something out there to make sure it floats. Make sure this isn't a Capricorn movie or something like that. There's Nicole Stott, a uh, colleague, uh, female engineer. Uh, there's the, that's Kevin Ford, first time flyer, pilot. And there you see Christopher Fugelsen opening up the payload bay doors. We do that almost immediately to initiate cooling. The radiators are in the inside portion of the payload bay doors, and Christer gets the honor of initiating that. After that, the mid-deck, where the three astronauts were, is reconfigured. We put away their seats, uh, and, and then after that, uh, we activate important things such as the bathroom, the kitchen galley, and then, uh, and then I get I start getting the computers out that are going to help us with the rendezvous phase of flight. So I get them out and start networking them, putting them together. And uh, the commander is the last one to come down and dress in street clothes. You can see he still has that orange launch entry suit. One of the first things Nicole does is she puts together the cycle ergometer. Recall now that we're floating in space continuous, so we're not using our leg muscles so that we don't suffer from uh, muscular atrophy. We have a protocol to exercise uh, every, every day, a half hour. Every morning, we do the same thing we do at home, brush our teeth. Those of us that need to shave, we shave. Uh, we have a good breakfast, and then we look at what we need to do that day. The second day of flight, we fire the Ohm's engines, which is called the Ohm's Maneuvering System engines. Those are the ones that get us closer to the International Space Station, because we're going to physically talk with the International Space Station. There you see uh, Nicole Stott looking at what will be her home for the next uh, three months. We're doing a crew rotation, and, uh, and she's going to stay behind. And, and we're going to bring someone home who's been up there for three months. And, and so what we do is we get closer and closer to the, sh to the shuttle, to the station, 
and we stop at about 600 yards. We do a rotation maneuver. We do that because this is the view of the astronauts on the station of us. They're taking pictures of our underbelly, our thermal protection system, to make sure we didn't damage it on the way up. That's what happened to Columbia, and that's why they had that catastrophic failure on their return. The thermal protection system was breached, and, uh, and, and hence they didn't make it back home. What we do now is we, we have go for what's called proximity operations, which means we're going to make physical contact and hopefully stay connected to the International Space Station. And, 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 and that's what you're seeing there that we're doing. Uh, and, and what happens is everybody has a job there in terms of getting connected and, and staying uh, uh, and, and making sure that we, we approach on target uh, the International Space Station. And, and as you see, people are, 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 have their jobs. Some people are taking pictures. Some people are controlling the vehicle. I'm giving uh, distant space and, and, uh, and, and trajectory information to the pilots so they can make the, the, the adjustments that they need to make. That's the target that the uh, pilots aim for when they, when they actually make the uh, connection. And you can actually tell when, when we actually bump into the space station. The, uh, you, you'll see a, a little bump there as, as we uh, in, in, in the picture, and then we verify that we stay connected. Everybody's happy that we did stay connected, and this allows us to open up the hatch to give us access to the International Space Station. The folks on the International Space Station uh, open up their respective hatch, and now we have uh, we have access to go from one vehicle to the other without doing a spacewalk. We just go through a tunnel that's been pressurized. And on the other side is a crew of six astronauts waiting for us. Gennady Padalka is the commander, a Russian. We rotate commander duties between American and US. And this time it was a Russian. So my Russian did come in handy. Six of us, six of them are waiting for seven of us to board. So that's a total of 13 astronauts at once in space. Uh, f five, from five different countries, truly an international effort. And you can see they're real happy to see us, not, not because we're good buds, but these guys have been up there for months on end, and they know we have fresh fruit and vegetables. So they're trying to, uh, they're trying to siphon off as much as they can from us. Uh, and then uh, the next day, we get to work. Uh, did you see that robotic arm? That was one of my principal duties as flight engineer. I was also one of the principal robotic arm operators. You see us take that cylinder there. That cylinder is called the multi-purpose logistics module. It contains more than seven tons of equipment, uh, experiments, and food and water that we need to transfer over to the International Space Station. We do this by pulling it out of the payload bay door, connecting it to a port on the International Space Station with the robotic arm, and then that allows us to open it from the inside after we pressurize it. And, uh, and, and, and so that allows us to do the transfer at our convenience in a uh, room type environment. And that's when we start transferring the seven tons of equipment. Uh, it looks easy because you know, things don't weigh anything in space, right? So you can just move, you can just move things uh, relatively easy. You just uh, set up a supply chain like we do there, and we move things from one place to another. Very important to put things in their right, in their right place because, uh, because uh, you know, looking for stuff on the International Space Station, if it's not in the right place, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. So, so, so there you see us initiating the first of seven tons of equipment that needs to be transferred over. Uh, you see Nicole Stott there removing an experiment rack from the shuttle and she's transferring over to the International Space Station. Why does she do that? Recall I told you that she's gonna stay behind so all her experiments get transferred over to the International Space Station and that's part of the process that she's doing. At the end of every day, we have a tag up meeting you can, you can see that orientation is not a problem. You see one of our guys is upside down. Uh, I, to, I told him he's upside down, and his response to me was, N no, I'm not. You guys are. Uh, turns out there is no right side up or right side down in space, right? So, so we were both right. The guy in the blue shirt, Nick, uh, Tim Copra, he's the one that's coming back with, with us. He's been up there for three months. He and I have the dubious honor now of, uh, of uh, dressing the astronauts that are gonna do a spacewalk. Uh, two astronauts do a spacewalk at a time, and then uh, the, uh, we're the suit guys, so we make sure they put on their suits uh, correctly, 
that there's no breach, everything is sealed, gloves, boots, everything, and, uh, and, and life support systems working, communication, camera, everything's working properly. And once we do that, uh, then they get the green light to go outside. And if you guys ever wondered how it is to, uh, to go outside in space, it's very simple. They just, uh, we, we get out of there, they depressurize that little room, and then that allows them to open up the hatch to go to the outside. And, uh, and, and there's a person inside playing quarterback that's basically guiding them along their seven hour spacewalk. And there you can see uh, Danny Olivas coming out of the hatch for the first time and going to the work site. You see those uh, orange handles there? Those handles are used for translating short distances. And, 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 and of course, when uh, they have to translate long distances, we use the robotic arm. Here you can see uh, a reflection of the astronauts using their helmet cams. We're able to look at their hands because it helps us explain to them what they need to be doing from the inside. And then uh, they can also take pictures of themselves or even uh, take pictures of us as they look from the outside to us on the inside because that's where we're doing our quarterback operations from. And then you see the robotic arm when they have to go long distances then we, uh, then I'm the one that's playing, uh, uh, playing taxi for them. I take them from one place to the other. Because recall, the uh, International Space Station is as big as a football field. It's as big as a football. So, so the robotic arm helps uh, the process of getting them from one place to another in 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 a very quick uh, way. And 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 as they as they do that. They, they go ahead and, uh, and move from place to place. Remember, we go around the world once every 90 minutes. So you got 45 minutes of daylight, 45 minutes of nighttime. They don't stop during nighttime. All they do is turn on their helmets, uh, their, their helmet lights, and they continue working. Time is too valuable. They're using up consumables, battery power, and air, and so we got to make sure they work the full seven hours because time is of the essence once they're out there. Once they uh, start running out of consumables seven hours on in, then we uh, let them back inside, and we let them back inside because, uh, uh, well, because we have to, right? And, um, and, and, and so we're in a hurry to get them out of their suits because it took us about three hours to get them in the suits and do all the systems checkouts. So they've been in there for 10 hours now in that suit. Now they're not thirsty because they have a little bottle, they have a little bag of water with a straw. But if they drank that water, I could guarantee you they want to go to the restroom. And, uh, and they're hungry, they're tired, so we get them out of the suit and, and, and let them go about their business because they have two more spacewalks. We did a, a total of three spacewalks out there. And, and, and so uh, while they're doing that, other astronauts are busily working on the inside. Remember that multi-purpose logistics module? Well, this is part of the equipment that we're transferring over. This piece of equipment is a treadmill. Uh, never can a, a two people carry that here on Earth because it weighs over 500 pounds. But in space, it's relatively easy. You just push it and, and keep pushing it and guide it, and you can put it on. There's the tracks for that treadmill. Uh, this is a piece of equipment we installed for them so the astronauts can exercise uh, while in space. Our commander, the guy in the red hat, he was the uh, quarterback for the multi-purpose logistics module. In other words, anything that went outside or went inside that room got logged and initialed by him just so we can have good chain of custody control of all pieces of equipment going out. Uh, and then, and then uh, once we empty the... Uh, the, the, the uh, multi-purpose logistics module, the racks rotate in a pretty neat fashion as you see me rotating that rack uh, because in the back of that rack is, uh, is more equipment that needs to be transferred out. Here you see uh, our commander uh, transferring a delicate piece of equipment to the Japanese experiment module. And, uh, and then we also use our legs as another part, a pair of hands. As you can see, we don't use our legs for walking, so we might as well put them to work as another pair of hands. So we become very innovative and become more efficient. And then there's also time to play, a little bit uh, time to play around. Uh, Nicole Stott asked me to film this for her, for her nine-year-old uh, kid. And uh, I, I was more than happy to do so. Then I saw something in the back, and I told Nicole, come here. Uh, I think your son's going to like this. So she came, and then I pushed her real hard. And then uh, there's a, some bungee cords back there. <laughs> For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, right? Uh, and there, uh, we, you see Daniel Olivas playing with water. This is how water behaves in zero G. 
And then, uh, and then Tim Copra puts a lifesaver in there, calls it a space eyeball. And then, of course, uh, he takes care of it. <laughs> okay, Kevin Ford did this to a tortilla. I would never do this to a tortilla. Put, put peanut butter on one side and jelly on the other, wakala. And then he called, it, he called that a, uh, a, a popsicle. Our commander gets a haircut every two days, like a good Marine, whether he needs it or not. Ever wondered about hygiene in space? Well, we get a, uh, we get a uh, the way we clean ourselves is a cowboy shower. We wet a rag, rub ourselves, dry ourselves, put shampoo in our hair, and then we just dry ourselves, and we're good to go. Yeah, so, so yes, we do come home pretty ripe afterwards. <laughs> you need a PhD in orbital mechanics to explain to me why this happens, a minor, minor major axis shift. Intrigued me enough that I told these guys, hey, do that to me, maybe it'll happen to me too. But uh, apparently, apparently I wasn't rotating fast enough. So they claim. And this is my perspective, so in case you're asking, did I get dizzy while rotating? Yes, I did. Now it's uh, getting ready time to come home. So what you see me with the, at the robotics workstation, putting away that round cylinder, putting it back into the uh, payload bay of the shuttle. We're taking it back home for the most part empty. We got trash and stuff that they don't need. We're bringing it back home. And then for the first time in the last evening of the night of, the, of our trip, all 13 of us get to eat dinner together uh, because we've been eating in different shifts, you know, three or four of us at a time because we were so busy. And everybody's anxious to show off their skills of eating in zero G. You know, and everybody wants to get filmed. They're saying, film me, film me. So we film some people, and then some people don't deserve to be filmed because they're not ready for prime time. <laughs> he was hoping I didn't catch that, but I said, oh, yeah, I got it. This is how we drink water in space. You know, we got these uh, neat bags with pincher straws so the water doesn't come out. Now it's time to come home. And so remember, Nicole thought stays behind. So as she closes that door, you can conclude that that's the International Space Station side. And then we back off that little tunnel, and then uh, we close off our hatch as well, depressurize that center section, and now it's time to separate ourselves from the International Space Station. And Christopher Fuglesang, our Swedish astronaut, gets the honors of doing that. He pushes the, uh, the button, and, uh, and it's time to... Uh, it's time to in, uh, initiate the separation process. Separation process is a little slow and tedious. Everybody, just like talking, everybody has an assignment to do. It's, uh, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's high on crew resource management uh, because everybody has a job and uh, we're so close to the station, we wanna make sure we don't damage it or bump into it. We also wanna minimize the firing of our jets because the exhaust plumes contaminate the uh, the, the solar panels and that reduces efficiency. So, so we try to move as little and as slow as possible uh, when, we, when, when we do this process. And, uh, and again, you'll see me at the computers uh, giving speed, direction, uh, dire uh, trajectory, and, uh, and distance to the, uh, to the pilots so they can make the adjustments that need to be ma made to uh, stay on trajectory, on the desired trajectory. Other people are taking film, uh, pictures, other people are talking to Mission Control Houston, uh, other people are at the controls of the shuttle, and, and then there's other people backing everybody else up. Uh, here we are about 20 yards away from the station. Remember the station is as big as a football field, so it's as big as this football field here. Uh, and the inside portion is about as big as a five bedroom home. So it's pretty big. If you lose something there, it's hard to find. And then we f we, what we do is we fly a circular trajectory around the station, because now it's our turn of taking pictures of them, making sure that they haven't suffered any micrometeorite orbital debris hits. And uh, the engineers on the ground will study these high resolution pictures as we do the full tr cir circular trajectory. After that, then it's time to put on our orange pumpkin suits, as I call them. They're called launch entry suits. They're pressurized. We put on the suits, we put on the helmets, and then, uh, and then we fire the jets to actually slow us down. As we slow down from that 17,500 miles an hour speed, the atmosphere captures us. And, uh, and, and as it captures us, you can see gravity starts taking hold, and all of a sudden, we're coming home. And you gotta understand that we start entering the atmosphere at 25 times the speed of sound, Mach 25. And then uh, our landing speed is about 210 miles. 
an hour. So we slow down to that, and you and you can see the uh, the the launch uh, the flight director giving us uh, the final instructions: what runway to land on, what the winds, what the uh, cloud ceiling is like, everything that a pilot needs to know to land the vehicle. And you also got to understand that we're coming in via gravity. We're not powered flight. Uh, we have power for our instruments, but we don't have any propulsion. So we have to land it right the first time. There's no, there's no uh, let's do it over again. It's, you got to land it the first time, because then you won't have the energy to land it. Uh, and so that's why we practice it so much. The, the weather was bad in, uh, in Florida, uh, so we delayed entry one day, which was great, because we had a play day there. And then, uh, and then the weather was still bad in Florida, so we ended up landing at Edwards Air Force Base, Southern California. And, uh, and at about 60,000 feet, the, uh, the orbiter starts behaving like an airplane. The, surface, the aerodynamic surfaces start responding, and now the pilots are flying it like an airplane. They have a heads-up display, HUD display, that's called, which uh, helps them in the landing process. To me, it's just one big video game, as you'll see the, uh, the, 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 the screen there. Uh, if you're, you're able to play video game, you're able to land a shuttle is what I tell my commander. He doesn't appreciate that. Um, and again, I'm, I'm the, uh, I'm, I'm the uh, flight engineer, so I'm hawking all the instruments, making sure everything is working appropriately, giving the, uh, the, the right signals to the, both the commander and the pilot. And then they round up, they fly a semicircle, line up to the runway, which is that green line you see there. And uh, within a few minutes, we're going to be uh, touching the ground and uh, be home there. And I never get tired of looking at this landing because, uh, we, first of all, we landed in, in California. Second, uh, you can see that about 400 feet. It's, uh, it's very important our pilot never forget this, and that is to uh, bring the gear down, because uh, that will be the last time we'll be landing it. I see you coming to the ball bar. Okay, a little more aft You're check. on the center line, on the ball bar. Coming a little right. On the center line, on the ball bar. Keep coming. Keep coming. Keep coming. Keep coming. Keep coming. There's 5230. And uh, you can see how the uh, commander lands the, the uh, ship. The wheels in the back touch at the right at the same time. It's just a beautiful landing. Never get tired of, of watching it. After the nose gear touches the runway, then uh, it's time for the parachutes to come out, and it slows us even further down at 60 knots. The commander then applies the pedal brake to come to a full stop. Once he announces that it's a full stop, that's when the stopwatch stops, and that's the official end of mission. Copy, we'll stop. Welcome home, Discovery. Congratulations on an extremely successful mission, stepping up science to a new level on the International Space Station. And uh, <laughs> wanna wanna thank you very much. I know I took a little longer than expected, but I think it was very important you guys uh, see that. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jose. We have a gift for you. Thank you. On behalf of the Subiendo class of 2012, we want to present you with this gift. Thank you for being here and speaking to us. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know we've got um, plane rides to catch, and um, I know I'm going to get you to the airport too. So thank you very much for a wonderful week and program. Congratulations again to all of you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you.